Let's start this up. Good morning, Allie. Good morning, Willa. Good morning, Mike. Good morning. All right. Um, okay. Get everything located here. Um, there. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, <clears throat> we're going to uh, mostly finish up FOIA series. We might have a little bit left over on um, Monday. Um, but uh, today's plan is. Uh, to go over some symmetry arguments uh, with Fourier series and some of the other properties um, that allow us to use Fourier series as solutions for partial differential equations, in particular Laplace's equation, uh, which you saw uh, certainly uh, in different uh, cases uh, in E and M uh, around chapter three or so in um, Griffiths. Um, and also uh, how you can use Fourier series to uh, find the value of infinite sums and uh, look at the uh, average value of oscillating functions. Um, you're probably aware of things like finding this, the average value of, uh, say, a magnetic field or um, the pointing vector or things like that, which you can use Fourier series for. Um, some announcements and some changes. The office hour changes. These are the ones that are scheduled. So. Um, you can always uh, ping me. I always have my phone on or I'm near a computer. So um, even if I'm not by my computer and I've got my phone with me and you ping me and it's during sort of business hours, um, uh, I'm happy to either uh, email you or um, to Zoom uh, with you. So uh, what I've done is shift the office hours a little bit. So they're two to three Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Now I know that conflicts with advanced lab. So what I've done is increase the office hours on Tuesday, move my long office hours to Tuesday, two to four. I'm also from now on having the homework due on Tuesdays at um, uh, five o'clock-ish. So, um, so there's that. So you have an opportunity to get a hold of me. And if you're in ad lab or if you have other classes and you cannot meet those, just send me an email um, and I'll be happy to. I've done that already a couple of times um, and I'm happy to do that. And, and it turns out that it's easier if you, if you can manage it to get on Zoom um, to answer some, uh, some brief questions. Uh, but if you can't, if we just need to email, we can do that too. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that we could do if it's easier for you, um, we're kind of past me caring about Facebook uh, niceties. Uh, so if you want to um, contact me through Facebook, uh, go ahead and do that. Uh, we can FaceTime or whatever. I'm, yeah, I, I, I had a number of you as friends on Facebook and then I, I purged my Facebook friends list because I was leaving Facebook. And now um, it's the only way that I can actually connect with people. So uh, I'm happy to bring you all back. Aren't I awesome? I'm gonna clip this video part out so that nobody sees that. So this is where I'll go. The other thing is, um, you don't have to, obviously. Um, the other thing is your midterm, your first midterm is a week from today. Um, I'm still writing it, um, but what I am planning on doing is having it be four questions and you can choose three, something like that. Um, it'll cover all the first three um, uh, problem sets, so they'll, um, definitely be coverage of infinite series, so convergence of infinite series, um, complex analysis, so be able to do Laurent expansions, use the Cauchy integral theorem, uh, calculate residues, things like that, and then some question on Fourier series that'll be similar to the stuff that's in the homework. And if you look at the homework, there's only, I think, four or five, five questions in the homework on Fourier series. I think it's because we've kind of seen this stuff before and we're just trying to expand it. Are there any questions before we start? Okay, 
Um, let's get going then. Uh, so what I wanted to start today with were symmetries. So far, we've only talked about um, periodic functions on a particular interval, say minus pi to pi. That's not always uh, convenient. Um, so for example, we have, um, we can start with our symmetry arguments. Uh, usually we look from minus pi to pi, but sometimes zero to two pi, and we know. And uh, I do wanna correct a typo from uh, last time. I think I had the sum go from n equals zero. So it should be from n equals one in the A um, expansion. So A, and A sub n cosine and x. Um, this is what f of x is equal to if f of x is even on that interval, right? We know that if just from symmetry, um, if f of x is even on the interval from minus pi to pi, uh, that we only have to worry about the cosine. Um, otherwise, it's equal to the sine uh, expansion. Again, on uh, that interval. Uh, we, we can't always uh, be assured that we're going to be on something so mathematically neat. Uh, so one thing that's useful is to consider how we change uh, the interval. And we'll see a couple of examples of that. Well, let's first start with the most straightforward one. That is that, it, let's say that this is a function that's um, periodic not on, um, not in, in phi necessarily, but from uh, minus L to L, right? Uh, so F of X then is equal to, again, A naught over two plus uh, the sum from N equals one to infinity, A sub N uh, cosine N pi X over L, right? So now uh, we are, um, normalizing it to this L plus RB series or sine series, sine of N pi X over L. These are all the arguments of the tree functions. Uh, with uh, the usual definition, so with uh, A sub N equal to uh, basically two over the interval, right? So one over L times the integral from minus L to L of say F of T times cosine of N pi T over L DT and B sub N uh, is equal to one over L times the interval from minus L to F of T sine of N pi T over L DT. Um, and again, that's what you would do if this is periodic on the interval of the, the interval minus L to L. And that's pretty straightforward. We're just making um, a variable change in the argument right over there, pi over L. Um, where this can be uh, more interesting um, or more useful, um, let's see. I'm not sure I, shoot, am I recording? Yes, okay. Hopefully I'm recording this. I can't remember. <laughs> Shit. Um, hang on a second. It says you're recording on my screen. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, it's early. It's not early, but it's a good excuse. Thank you. Uh, okay, so let's look at an example. In this case, um, an asymmetric, whoa. All right, asymmetric square wave. So what do we mean by that? Um, well, let's consider um, a function that has a square pulse from zero to one, and then is equal to zero out to two L. 
So this has a value of h over here. This, ha this is at one, and then uh, this is equal to zero. So in other words, f of x is equal to h from x, uh, for x equal to zero from zero to one, and is equal to zero from one to two l. And what we want to do then is look at, consider the expansion on the interval minus L to L, right? So this, and, and the idea then is that this would be a, a repeating function. And um, so we'd have something like this over here, and then um, there would be another uh, term over here. All right, so we're trying to fit this, but now uh, the, the pulse is asymmetric in our uh, interval. Um, what we can identify is the midpoint over here. This would be oops, green, uh, L plus a half over here. This space over here is equal to 2L minus 1. So the geometry of the square pulse then uh, implies the following. Um, we can write a sub n is equal to h over l. So again, half of the, the region that we're trying to do this expansion. And then we substitute in the value of f of x. So from zero to one, this is cosine of n pi x over l dx, or h over n pi times sine of n pi x over L, evaluated from zero to one, or h over n pi times sine of n pi over L, with again, usual n equals one, two, three, and so on. We'll call this C point do, five. Do other people have the screen cut out on the right side? Yeah. How's that? There we go. Okay, that's weird. Um, hang on a second, let me see. Um, how does that work? Can you see everything now? Yeah. Okay, all right, sorry about that. Um, okay, is that, um, I don't know why we're having problems today. Uh, is that, big enough to be seen? Is that legible? Okay, so it's kind of small on my screen, but we'll go ahead, as long as you can see it. All right, so uh, B sub n then should be similar. H over L times the integral from zero to one of sine of n pi x over L dx is equal to minus H over n pi times cosine of n pi x over L evaluated from zero to one. So that's equal to h over n pi times one minus cosine of n pi over L. Again, with n equals one, two, and three. We see six, okay. Um, and so we have f of x is equal to h over pi times the sum from n equals one to infinity uh, of one over n, times sine of n pi over L, times cosine of n pi x over L, plus one minus cosine n pi over L, times sine of m pi x over L. Okay, uh, C point seven. This is just our expansion then we arrive substituted in the a sub n's and the b sub n's, okay? Um, and if we uh, set L equal to one, it should uh, agree with the square waves. Um, that's perfectly fine. I've got you on multiple screens here, so I'm looking over in the wrong direction. Um, that's perfectly fine. But this also suggests that we can uh, make a change, whoa. All right. That may that suggests 
that we can make a change in variable so that we uh, take advantage of the symmetry. Um, note that f of x is symmetric about uh, the point x is equal to 2L plus 1 over 2. It's sort of the midpoint that I drew uh, up last time, L plus a half, right? Um, so we can let squiggle be equal to x minus 2L plus 1 over 2. In other words, x is shifted by an amount L plus a half. Um, this allows us to create a pure cosine series, which is what we would get, which is what we would ordinarily um, consider for a square wave. Um, in that case, we would get, I'll, I'll use a capital A-N in this case, uh, H over L um, evaluated from L minus a half to L plus a half, since we're shifting everything so that we have this purely um, periodic, uh, evenly distributed, uh, symmetric um, pulse or wave. Cosine of n pi squiggle over L d squiggle. And that's equal to h over n pi sine of n pi squiggle over L. All of this is, that's an L. All of this is evaluated from L minus a half to L plus a half. And uh, further, this is equal to H over N pi times sine of, make sure I get all this right, N pi over times two L plus one over two L minus sine of N pi 2L minus 1 over 2L. Or if we combine terms, um, this is equal to minus 1 to the N times 2H over N pi times sine of N pi over 2L. And because of the symmetry, you can show that the b sub n terms are equal to zero now that we've done this shift. And as a result, we should get something that looks like what we did last time, namely f of x is equal to 2h over pi times the sum from one, n equals one to infinity of minus one to the n over n times sine of n pi over 2L times now the cosine argument of this shifted x. So it's cosine of n pi times x minus L minus a half over L. Okay, so that's one way of dealing with uh, an asymmetry. So both uh, this uh, equation, so call it C8. C8 and C7 are equivalent. It's just to shift the variables. Okay. That's a lot of writing, so take a break if you need to. We ready? Okay. Um, next, in fact, uh, essentially the last part of this section, what I want is uh, what I want to do is look at specific applications um, for for a series, and and some of this uh, your book uh, deals with explicitly. Uh, a lot of it, it doesn't. I'll start with one that's fairly straightforward. That is the full wave rectifier. 
Right, so uh, in that case, we have our f of t is equal to sine of omega t from omega t between 0 and pi. And f of t is equal to minus sine of omega t from minus pi to 0. In other words, we're just looking at the absolute value of sine of omega t, right? Um, so what we're dealing with is trying to represent, um, right, this guy, right, where we've just taken the negatives and uh, replaced them um, with positives. Now this is an even function, so what, which series can we get rid of? So it's even on minus pi to pi, right? So which one of these is equal to zero? B sub n. Right, B sub n is equal to zero because this is an even function on the periodic interval. Um, so first step is to uh, compute A sub zero. That's just minus, one over omega pi times the integral from minus pi to zero of sine of omega t d omega t plus one over pi uh, from zero to pi of sine omega t d omega t since we're using um, this frequency space and so that's equal to two pi times zero to pi of sine omega t d omega t or four over pi. Okay, so that's the A zero term. Okay, we just combine those intervals. Um, the next step is then to find the A sub n's. So the A sub n is just two over pi, right? Well, um, one over half the um, periodic interval. Uh, times uh, zero, the integral from zero to pi of sine omega t cosine of n omega t d omega t. And then this starts getting us into, um, I think, a property, properties that you've seen already, namely that depending on the value of n, um, these terms vanish, right? So this is equal to minus two over pi times two over n squared minus one when n is even and zero when n is odd. And that's just because we're multiplying by or we're uh, evaluating cosine n uh, pi in that interval. Okay, so this is d3. And once we have those uh, coefficients, we can then write our f of t in terms of uh, cosines, namely our a naught minus four over pi times the sum over all even n's of cosine of n omega t over n squared minus one, where we've just taken this value, right, and then multiplied it by the cosine term. And if we further uh, replace this, we can write this as 2 over pi minus 4 over pi times the sum of cosine of 2n omega t over 4n squared minus 1, where now we can just take the full uh, sum, where we're just forcing uh, the arguments to be even. What does this get us? Well, um, so we've taken this um, weird function of sine and made it a, a purely cosine, um, made a purely cosine representation of it, but we have broken it apart into a series of cosines of different frequencies. So the lowest frequency is 
is actually two omega, right? Uh, if we expand this out, uh, we get two over pi minus four over three pi cosine two omega t uh, plus minus four over 15 pi cosine four omega t. And so not only do we have the lowest frequency in this expansion or this representation of this, uh, of this functional form of this waveform, uh, but we also know that high frequency terms fall as n to the minus two, because they drop away pretty quickly. <clears throat> so I'm, sh well, I'm not sure. Did you see, do anything like this in electronics? No, okay. Well, here's an example that might apply to electronics. Maybe, I don't know. I don't teach electronics, so I don't know. Okay, leave that there. Uh, one thing that I do know that you have seen, although it may have been a while, is a uh, solution for a uh, Laplace equation. And in particular, let's consider a long uh, cylindrical pipe that's held at two different, uh, and it's hollow, and it's held at two different uh, potentials, right? So we look at the cross section. Right? We will hold this at plus V, a constant, and we'll hold the bottom uh, hemisphere or hemi cam, I guess, hemi cylinder, whatever. Uh, to minus V, right? And so we want to know uh, what V of R phi is in cylindrical coordinates. Okay, so we're ignoring the Z component. Um, that means that we have to go to our um, memory bank and recall what Laplace's equation is in cylindrical coordinates. Who wants to help me out here? <laughs> Are you trying to avoid me, Stephen? No, I've got my E and M book somewhere nearby. <laughs> um, okay. Well, we we all know, right, that we're basically solving this, right? So it's just a matter of remembering what is the uh, cylindrical version, cylindrical coordinate version of this. Um, and uh, just to refresh your memory, it's one over R, if we're using R's instead of rows, uh, D, D, R of R, D, V, D, R, right? So that's the R term, plus one over R squared, D squared, V, D phi squared, right? Equals V, capital V, right? Um, and then we would have a Z term there. And, the, and the, one of the ways that you know that this works, right, is that the, um, the dimensional analysis ought to work, right? It's a potential divided, it has units of potential divided by uh, length squared, right? Which is why we have to have that one over R squared in the phi term, okay? So um, how do we go, what's this, the prescription for solving Laplace's equation? that you did in e and M. What do we call that? Separation of variables? Right, so we se use separation of variables, which means that we uh, consider our V is composed of two functions that depend only on either R or phi, right? Um, that means that um, Laplace's equation dV squared V is equal to little r over r, d dr times r, dr dr, r dr dr, plus one over phi d squared phi d phi squared, and set that equal to zero, right? And the way, just to remind you of how we got there is that you, substitute in uh, this into um, this, right? And since uh, each term only depends on one 
one of the variables, you can separate all of that out. Um, this, as far as uh, the right part of this is concerned, is a constant, right? In other words, it's a constant in phi. And this term is a, is it called C2, is a constant in R, right? So we can move them to the other side and then start solving them. Um, we'll do the, so actually we can just write this out. If you are judicious um, and think through the nature of your solutions, right? We know that uh, phi has to be periodic. Right, we know that at little r equals r, right, v has to be equal to the boundary conditions, uh, which means that it has to flip sign as you go from zero to pi and then pi to my, to two pi. So that means that um, this equation has to be equal to a negative constant, right? Um, so when we expand it out, that means that we can set this equal to some constant a times cosine we'll call it k of phi plus b sine k of phi. Whereas r, and of course, I'm implicitly putting that dependence in there. What, do, what are the possibilities for the radial solution? Anybody remember? It's a linear combination. The C E to the positive I K R plus D E to the negative I K R? Uh, almost. The, once you put the I's in there, you end up with the with the periodic stuff again. So with with the with the cylindrical coordinates that we've established here, we do have two different cases. One is um, R to the K and D R to the minus K. Right, so those are our two general solutions. Um, we know that d is has to be equal to zero. Why? Because otherwise it would blow up. <laughs> exactly right. So if you remember back again to like chapter three, I think, or chapter four, Griffiths. I think it's chapter three. Right, depending on whether you're inside or outside some kind of conducting pipe or sphere, the uh, C term goes to zero if it blows up at infinity, or the D term uh, goes to zero if it blows up at the origin. So we know that D is equal to zero. Um, so we can write that V is equal to the sum uh, from K equals one to infinity of, we'll call the C sub K R to the K times a k cosine k phi plus b k sine k phi. Um, now, there is a special case if k is equal to zero, right? You might remember that the solution is a constant plus the natural log of r. That's just because of the way the, the um, differentiation works out. But this is what we are uh, focusing on. We know that for r equal to r, v has to be equal to our boundary condition. Um, so we know that it has to be v uh, plus v and minus v appropriately. Uh, we also know um, one other thing, right? So what, uh, what do we know about v? as a function on this interval. It doesn't have any maxima or minima. That's right. I mean, yep, yep. What about V on the, when you get to R, how would you describe that function? So I, I drew it like this. We have plus V and minus V, but if we, wrap this out from say uh, minus pi to pi, right? So it's an... A step function? Well, and how would you it's describe it? What's that? 
Discontinuous. Discontinuous. On the interval, how can we describe this function just mathematically, apart from discontinuous? Yes. When we do Fourier series, we're interested in two kinds of functions, generally speaking, because then we can get rid of one of the um, expansions. Symmetrical. So what, how, is it symmetrical? Odd. Odd, thank you, yes, it's an odd function. All right, so, um, so let's look, so at, at r equals r, um, we know that, um, let's see, v of r phi, uh, for phi uh, less than pi, from zero to pi, is equal to the sum over k of a sub k cosine k phi, plus the sum of, over k of b k sine k phi, and that has to be equal to plus v for phi uh, that's between uh, between pi and two pi. We know that um, this is basically the same thing, but equal to minus v. And from all of this. Because the function is odd, we know that v is equal to uh, v times v sub k times sine of k phi. If it were even, then we would keep the a terms. It's not, so we're keeping the odd terms. Uh, here we're defining a sub k is equal to c k a k r to the k, right? It's just a big constant. Everybody with me? Um, okay, so that means we need to find out what b sub k is. b sub k is just the integral from one over pi, or one over pi times the integral of zero to pi of v, that function, times sine of ky, uh, or k phi, sorry, d phi, minus one over pi, times the integral from pi to two pi of v of sine of k phi d phi, um, which we can combine and you can show is two v over k pi times minus cosine of k phi, evaluated from zero to pi. So that's two v over k pi times one minus cosine of k pi. And that equals four v over k pi for k odd and zero for k even. All right, so we now have our b's. Um, we have our original expression uh, for the potential using Laplace's equation. So now we could write V of R theta, which is what we wanted um, in the end, which is the sum over all odd K, since the even ones equal zero of CK, RK, uh, BK, sine of K phi. We break all of that out. That's equal to the sum over odd k of bk uh, rk, capital RK, little rk over k times sine of k phi. And that's equal to 4v over pi times the sum over odd k of, and this is the reason why we wrote it this way, so, it's, so that it's normalized, little r over r to the k times sine of k phi over k. 
And if you wanted to, you could uh, collapse this into uh, a sum over all n. You would just replace um, odd k with 2n plus 1, right? Then all you would do is just, uh, then this summation ends up being over all n, and the arguments for k would become 2n plus 1. So for um, this somewhat classical problem of having two ends of a pipe with an insulating layer between that are held at two different potentials gives us this um, radial dependence, but also this azimuthal dependence that is um, odd. <clears throat> and um, if you like, I can do another example um, offline, uh, but I also would recommend if you have Griffiths with you um, to look at uh, chapter three, for example, so that they also do it in spherical um, coordinates as well. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, all right, how about another uh, application that gets us back to the first week? Infinite series. One of the uses of Fourier series that your book only touches lightly on is that you can use them to, um, because they have integrals based um, in their evaluation, and because they have sums in them, to evaluate um, series. So for example, Let's consider the function f of x equals x squared on the interval minus pi to pi, right? So we're just looking at this thing. Right? And just treating this as uh, something that we would want to do for a uh, decomposition of. Um, all right, so what do we know about a's and b's? Which one goes away? B goes away. Right. This is an even function. So B sub n is equal to zero. Right? Um, so A sub zero is equal to one over pi times the integral from minus pi to pi of x squared cosine nx dx. That's equal to two over pi times minus one to the n times two pi over n squared or minus one to the n times four over n squared. And then a sub n, oh wait a minute, that was a sub n, sorry. Skip the line, let's go back. a sub zero um, is equal to two pi squared over three. That's a pretty straightforward, um, that's just integrating one over x squared. Okay. Um, that means that you can write x squared as um, one half over, or times two pi squared over three plus four times the sum of minus one to the n cosine of nx over n squared. Now that may not seem like we're doing anything in particular, but let's let now x be equal to pi. That means that cosine of nx becomes cosine of n pi. And how might we write that? As n increases or changes value, what is that going to be equal to? One or negative one. Yeah, so we can write that as minus one to the n, so it'll flip back and forth. Right. So now we go back up here, and we have pi squared is equal to pi squared over three plus four times the sum from n equals one to infinity of one over n squared, four 
pi squared over six is equal to the sum from n equals one to infinity of one over n squared. And this is the Raymond uh, Zeman function or zeta function. that we bumped into in the first week, like on Wednesday of the first week. So you can do this for a number of different series. Is once you find the um, Fourier series, you can evaluate that x at, say, pi, um, and then come up with expressions either for pi or for some of these uh, infinite sums that we recognize as physically interesting or important um, functions, like the Zeman the zeta function. All right. Um, okay. Last bit on this. I'm kind of skipping around in my notes. So properties part two. Um, and basically what I wanna focus on are, uh, is basically integration and uh, differentiation. So in other words, what happens when you uh, integrate a Fourier series, right? So consider our usual Fourier series, f of x is equal to a naught over two plus the sum of from n equals one to infinity of a sub n times cosine n x plus the sum n equals one to infinity of b sub n cosine of n x. Um, without getting into the details, what does integration get us? <clears throat> so clearly, if we integrate this, we get another Fourier series. But what's different about this Fourier series than the previous Fourier series? The a sub n's and b sub n's will be applying to the opposite trig function. That's true, but that means that we'll, but overall, that means we still have a Fourier series. But what happens when we integrate cosine n of x or cosine of nx? You pull out an n. Right. Not only do you pull out an n, what do you pull out in particular? One over n. One over n, right? So this becomes a Fourier series that is divided by one over n. In other words, this converges more rapidly than f of x. And if you can tie f prime of x to f of x, you've created a way in which uh, your representation converges more quickly with fewer terms um, to your, the function that you were looking at. All right, so integration makes this uh, happen more quickly. You can guess, what about differentiation? Uh, I don't know why I put a prime there, sorry. There. Differentiation. All right, so now if we have f of x and we consider f prime of x, um, this converges more slowly. Because we have n times the Fourier series when we differentiate. Okay. Um, the last thing that I want to mention before we break out is Parseval's theorem.
Um, and that, uh, this is something that's applicable for a 4A series that's uniformly convergent on, um, on a, a periodic uh, region. And it's basically, it looks at the average value of 4A series. And in other words, we, if we have a 4A series that's uh, converged, that means it meets the Dirichlet condition, then one over two pi times the integral from minus pi to pi, if that's the region uh, in which this is, uh, periodic of f of x squared dx represents an average value uh, in some sense of f of x squared. And the nice thing about this is that when you do these average values for an oscillating function, you get numbers, right? So um, this is a way of finding the average of say one half a naught squared, right? It's just a naught squared over four. The average of a n cosine n x is equal to what? What's the average of cosine squared? One half. Yeah, one, so this would be one half times a n squared and the average of a n sine of n x is equal to one half b sub n squared. Um, so what that means is if we look at this integral of x squared dx, that is, we want to look at this average is just a naught squared over four plus one half times the sum of all the a sub n squareds plus one half times the sum of all the b sub n squareds. Um, so can you think of uh, um, an application of this? It would apply to like probability distributions? Yeah, you could do that. Um, certainly, uh, anytime you have basically a, a wave function, you're trying to find that average value. Um, so uh, you absolutely, uh, actually I hadn't thought of that, but that that's true. What I was thinking of was uh, things like um, flux um, and say uh, the um, intensity for E and M waves. Um, so the energy, uh, you know, when you look at B squared, um, instead of, if you consider the, the wave function uh, for an electromagnetic wave, um, and you need to find, say, the, the pressure term, that's gonna be B squared over A pi squared, depending on the units that you're using. Um, it's basically that the total energy of these waves is equal to the sum of the energies that's associated with all of these harmonics, in other words. Okay. Um, all right, let me move this over here. And I need to find my control screen. Uh, here we are. Uh, what I'd like to do is to try and, and uh, break this out. So what I think I'll do is, um, oh, here we go. Uh, more breakout rooms. Um, uh, here we go. Okay, um, you should be heading to your rooms.
to talk about your reflections. Are we intentionally being put in the same breakout room? Not on purpose. Did you do that? Did that happen again? Again, yeah. All right, <laughs> well, I'll be more attentive. It must be, are you next to each other alphabetically? No. No. Near each other. Maybe do, do you, and you don't join at the same time. No. All right. Well, I'll be more. Um, it, it's, it's presumably it's like randomized, right? I thought so. But then <laughs> we've only done this twice, right? So. I guess the next Not time will be there. Not a pattern yet, yeah. but I yeah. will be more mindful. I'm curious. True. Okay. All right, so we're all back. Um, who wants to share? What's the main thing? What's an example? Maybe, hopefully, something we haven't talked about. And, you know, on your own, you can sort of submit to me um, what's what you need what we'd like to see more of but remember also i think it wasn't quite explicit the first time out everybody has to submit something even if you do it in a group everybody writes something it's 15 percent of your grade and it's you do all three parts that's that's 100 percent. somebody go Um, uh, Steven and I talked about how it's really awesome how we can make non-continuous functions continuous. Um, and that just allows us to do a lot of other things with them that we wouldn't otherwise, like we couldn't integrate them and differentiate them now. Okay. Like we wouldn't necessarily be able to do that earlier. Okay. Cool. Okay. Um, now that I haven't muted myself. Um, we, we talked about Fourier transforms as ways to like move functions between different spaces, as weird as that sounds, of like moving into frequency space. And we talked about the example of like moving between position and momentum space and quantum and like doing Fourier transforms to go between those two. Yeah, I think the, the thing, and especially we'll see this in the last couple of weeks when we look at Fourier transforms and Laplace transforms, it can be that in physical space, a problem is impossible or difficult to solve, but when you transform it to frequency space, it's something that's really easy to solve. And the, the trick then is what are the inverse transforms? And Fourier series is a way, and Fourier analysis is a way of getting there. In fact, the complex series has already kind of brought that up. Good. 
I got one more. Uh, Adrian and I, mm -hmm. so the Fourier series are useful. Okay. <laughs> Why? <laughs> and, you know, we have a lot of like periodic functions and mm -hmm. lots of like approximate functions. You know, it's a good, good physics tool. Uh, helps us describe a lot of situations that we run in. We can see we got electronics, we got quantum, we got EM. It's really a wide range of, of things we got going on here. And it's so beautiful that we can describe it all with this new method. You, you sold me. Well said. Well said, Alex. Yes. <laughs> um, it's also, I think, I mean, that's right. <laughs> I think it's hard to argue, but it's also really nice if you think about it that what we're dealing with are fairly elemental um, functions that are easily integratable and easily differentiable. Right. It could have been that we have we could do this, but these these would be exponentials of signs of logs. Right. Doesn't really get us anywhere. The fact that we can replace some things with easy things that we know how to do that will lead in next week when we do um, differential equations and we look at uh, power series solutions for for differential equations. All right, that's enough. Um, I'll be around today. Otherwise, have a great weekend. I hope you guys are all doing well. And um, yeah, I miss all of you very much. And I wish you guys were here. I really do. So anyway, I'll see you sometime. All right. Bye, Meg. Bye, Will. Bye. Bye, Allie. Bye, Meg. Bye, Rick. Bye. Hey. What? Ah.